Hi everyone, welcome to Atoms and Sporks. In this video, I want to continue my discussion of the 2018 Physics Nobel Prize. Previously, we talked about one half of this year's prize, which went to Arthur Ashkin for his work on optical tweezers. Now I want to talk about the other half of the prize, which went to Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland for their method of generating high-intensity, ultra-short optical pulses. This method they invented is called Chirped Pulse Amplification, or CPA. So to start out, high-intensity, ultra-short pulses. What's that about? When you think of a laser, you might probably think of a device like a laser pointer where you press down the button and the laser spits out a continuous beam of monochromatic light. Lasers are often compared based on how much optical power they produce, which in this case has a pretty clearer meaning. Say your laser pointer has an optical power of 1 watt, which by the way is a excessively powerful laser pointer and definitely illegal, but it's a nice round number. Well, a watt is a unit of power, or energy delivered per unit of time, and specifically one watt represents one joule of energy per second. So my one watt laser is outputting one joule of optical energy every second. A laser like this, which continuously puts out light, is called a continuous wave, or CW laser. However, there's another way we could do this. Let's say we took this same average power output, but dispensed it out in a number of short pulses. In this case, the average power is the same, however the peak power is quite a bit higher. How much higher? Well, the ultra shortness referred to in the Nobel Prize are pulses that are often only femtoseconds long. A femtosecond is one millionth of one billionth of a second, or zero points and then 14 zeros in a one seconds. So if we have our laser with one watt average power, and we imagine we dispense that power once a second in a single femtosecond pulse, then the peak or maximum power during the pulse has a power of 1,000 trillion watts. Again, it's really important to understand that the pulse only has this power for about a million billionth of a second, and the total power output by the laser is still just a watt. But still, during that briefest of moments, the concentration of energy of such an ultra-short pulse laser is 15 orders of magnitude higher than our continuous wave laser. Okay, so what? Well, for one thing, this allows us to do something that is super important which is to continue to name research lasers after mythological figures. I'm not going to say all lasers are named after mythological figures, but like, most of them? Okay, but other than I guess naming a new laser, like Icarus, what else are they good for? Well, at the lower power range, you have all the pulse lasers we use in technology. Whether it's laser eye surgery, or laser cutting and machining, or tattoo removal, or any number of manufacturing techniques used in the making of computer chips, and a bunch of other applications. However, when we're talking about the kind of powers obtainable by this chirped pulse amplification technique, we're talking about power levels that are generally way higher than these devices. But that's not to say there aren't potentially applications like this in the future, and people are looking into them, but despite what a lot of newspaper articles have said, it's pretty disingenuous to say that we're pursuing ultra-short pulse lasers mainly with an eye for conventional laser applications. We're pursuing them because at these energies, there's many, many possibilities to create exotic physics. For example, one big area of interest is nuclear fusion, the half-life 3 of energy technologies. Specifically, the greatest value of these ultra-short pulse beams is in a subtype of laser fusion designs called the fast ignition approach, which involves a two-pulse process where the second pulse especially must be very short and powerful and is necessary to ignite, so to speak, the fusion reaction. Of course, our main interest in nuclear fusion is for power applications, but being able to generate such outrageously high energy has a scientific side benefit as well. It allows us to potentially take the astrophysics of stellar interiors and supernovae and turn their investigation into an experimental science. We could reproduce those extreme processes that occur in the cosmos in a lab and study and measure them up close. There's also yet another thing you can do with these very, very high energy plasmas that you can create with these ultra short pulse lasers. You can make them into particle accelerators. The physics here can get fairly complicated, and to be perfectly honest, plasma physics is not really my thing, but the general idea is that in the wake of the passage of one of these laser beams, there are oscillations or waves in the plasma that result in very, very strong electric fields in certain regions. When you think of a particle accelerator, you might think of something like the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, or like this one in Stanford. That is three kilometers long. 
but in one of these so-called laser wake field accelerators, the acceleration is potentially over 1,000 times greater. That means you could potentially do just as much acceleration as this enormous multi-kilometer long thing in just mere meters, maybe even centimeters. In fact, more than that, as we'll see, chirped pulse amplification and similar tricks allow these energies to be achieved in facilities that just take up like a few rooms in a basement, and at a cost that is pennies on the dollar relative to the cost of these things. Now I should point out that this laser-driven particle accelerator approach is really only suited to accelerating certain types of particles and in certain ways, so it's unlikely it would ever completely replace something like this. But something I think maybe a lot of people don't appreciate is that we use particle accelerators for a lot more than heady blue sky, mind-bending, limits of reality, high-energy physics experiments. We actually use them all over the place in technology, whether in medicine for cancer therapy and diagnostics, and also in the production of medical radioisotopes, in manufacturing and product development and security in the form of terahertz spectroscopy and technology, and in a dozen other places. And therefore, the laser-based accelerators could also be a much easier and cheaper way to generate the particles in these sorts of applications. So, those are some of the situations where we either currently use these ultra-short pulse lasers, or could see using them in the future. Now, that was just a whirlwind overview, of course, nowhere near complete, and I didn't even get into the really exotic stuff up here, but hopefully it gives you an idea of why we want to build these things. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the actual progress we've made in achieving higher and higher peak power pulses. Now, the topic of who exactly invented the laser is actually a bit controversial, but let's say it was Ted Maiman in 1960, and I'll do my best to weather the disagreement. So in 1960, Ted Maiman invented the first functioning laser, and it was good. I mean, it was all right. Blu-ray players and sharks with freaking laser beams on their foreheads are pretty cool. However, it was basically immediately realized that some exciting things could be done if lasers were pulsed to maximize their peak power. And the first step along this line was a technology called Q-switching, which came around in, let's say, 1962. And this was followed by a technique called mode locking at about 1964. Now, I'm not really going to talk about how these techniques work, maybe another time, but my point is that within a decade, laser powers had already skyrocketed by like a factor of 10,000. Things were looking pretty good, but then laser peak power plateaued, and plateaued, and plateaued, and changed very little for like 20 years. And then something happened, something was invented, and things started going up, up, up again. Well, the thing that happened was the invention throughout the mid-1980s by Gerard Moreau and his PhD student at the time, Donna Strickland, of this chirped pulse amplification technique. So what is it? Well, in order to understand that, it's helpful to understand what exactly the issue was here. In kind of a cartoony way, a laser is about creating a scenario where a material, called a gain medium, has been forced or pumped into a state far from its happy equilibrium, where it basically allows errant light passing through it to copy or multiply itself. The physical mechanism here is called stimulated emission, which is what the S and E in the word laser stand for, but we don't really want to get too into how lasers work. The key thing is that if you pass the right kind of light through a gain medium, it then begets more light, and thus the beam is continually amplified. But when peak powers get super high, suddenly you get a big problem. At lower energies, the way light moves through a material is basically dictated by the material itself. The material has a certain what's called refractive index, and that dictates how light behaves inside of it. Basically, the material is the boss, and light follows its rules. However, when light gets ridiculously intense, things start changing. There is now so much concentrated energy in the light that it starts to change the properties of the material as it moves through the material. The fancy name for this is nonlinear optical effects, but what that really means is that light isn't a passive player anymore. It still obeys the rules of the material, but now its own intensity also changes the rules as it moves through the material. An important example of such an effect is so-called self-focusing. Because a real laser pulse isn't perfectly uniform in intensity, the strength of these nonlinear effects can vary throughout the beam and actually result in the laser basically driving itself inwards like a lens. At best, this can mess up the focus of the beam by the time it finally makes it out of the material. At worst, it can permanently damage the entire optical setup. In other words, it can break the laser. There was also a less dramatic issue that when pulses were so short and powerful, many gain media simply weren't that efficient at amplifying the beam further. 
Now these two earlier approaches that I mentioned, cue switching and mode locking, in a sense they were ways to increase the peak power of the laser pulse by cleverly making the pulses shorter. But what was happening here was that peak powers had gotten so high that the pulse couldn't be controlled or handled anymore because of these nonlinear optical effects like self-focusing. Though it's important to point out that it's not entirely fair to say that laser power didn't increase at all during this time. Rather, this issue of nonlinear optical effects has to do with focusing a lot of light energy into a narrowly focused beam. You could still increase the total energy of your pulse by just literally making everything bigger. So you're not raising the focused intensity and no one place has sufficient power density to hit these harmful effects. So during this time, lasers were getting more powerful by basically cheating and just getting bigger and bigger and consequently more and more expensive. Well, it was chirped pulse amplification to the rescue, not just in avoiding these harmful effects, but in also bringing laser science back to the tabletop. In fact, Gerard Moreau called this period in laser physics the triple cubed era, which stands for tabletop terawatt. Now the idea behind CPA is actually super simple. First, you use one of these other methods as what's called a C laser, which produces a nice short initial high energy pulse. You know, you start with the best that these guys can offer, then what you do is you pass it through something called a stretcher, which I'm not sure if you can tell by the name, but basically it stretches the light. It preserves the total amount of energy, but because the energy is spread out in time, the peak power is now lower. Once the peak power has been lowered, then you pass it through your gain medium to amplify it. Because the peak energy is lower, this is fine, because it's below the threshold for these nasty, non-linear self-focusing effects. So now you have a beam whose peak power is high, but not like amazingly high, that is long and stretched. The final step is to pass it through a compressor, which again, I know this techno babble can be hard to understand, but what this does is it compresses the light back to a short pulse. So voila, you've got a short pulse back, but now the peak power is way, way higher. So start with a nice pulse, stretch it, amplify it, then compress it back. That's chirp pulse amplification. You might wonder, by the way, what exactly chirped means. Well, a chirp signal is just one which is basically stretched or compressed. So that's what these compressors and stretchers are doing. They're chirping the light pulse. Now this idea might seem super simple. You might wonder why it took so many smart physicists and engineers 20 years to think of this. Well, as with anything, saying, would it be cool if we had a technology like this? is one thing, and actually making that technology is another. But one of the big issues was that these two processes had to effectively be perfect inverses of each other. If you compress more or less than you stretch, the quality of the pulse would be ruined. But in reality, the technology that was in these two boxes worked fairly differently. For example, our compressor actually sees the full power of the beam. And so if you use something like prisms or a lens here, you'd have these same self-focusing problems, and it'd be really hard to make it work. However, you totally can, and Moreau and Strickland did, use lenses here, because the beam energy is lower. In fact, we could talk a fair bit more about how they actually got both of these things to work, but that might be a bit overkill. The key takeaway is that by the stretch amplify compress trick, they allowed laser powers to soar again. And this allowed for progress for these things we talked about, you know, fusion power, tabletop particle accelerators, stuff like this. And that is why Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland were given a Nobel Prize. Have a good one.